Welcome, Phyllis. We're excited to have you here for a conversation on all things women's health and in light of your new book. Congratulations. I know um, we're receiving it soon. We're really excited, but I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about your career path in women's health and your path to the society and sort of what brought you here and sort of what did that path look like for you? Well, it's a long story. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, it was one of those things that one thing just led to another that led to another. There was no there was no advanced planning. So basically, I started working. I guess we, my husband and I moved to Washington, and I went to get my master's, and I interned at the American Psychiatric Association, and then I was hired. I had, uh, obviously, I, I was married. I already had three children, so I was older than a lot of the staff there, and I became friendly with the women psychiatrists who were closer in my age. And I heard them discuss about the fact that tenure was difficult, promotions were difficult, and particularly, and I had probably no understanding or knowledge about clinical trials at the time, um, talking about it, despite the fact that women suffered from depression and anxiety more than men, women were not in the clinical trials. So that was sort of my first um you know, my, my my first introduction to the fact that you know there was any difference between men and women. Of course, they were only looking at mental health issues because it was the psychiatric association. One of the psychiatrists that I I got very friendly with invited me to a meeting. I don't remember when this was like over. You know, like forty years ago, invited me to a meeting. Um, and it was during it was the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And it was a group of women, doctors and physicians. And the, the reason that they were meeting was because they felt that women were being ignored, that all the diagnostics and the testing um, and the medication, to the extent that there was medication at that point, they may not have been, was, was focused on men and pregnant women, not on women. And it's as it turned out later on, the uh, the symptoms of of, uh, of AIDS and also the treatments tended to be different, but at the time there was just focusing on men. So I started talking to actually Florence Hazeltine, who was then at um, NICHD, which is the National Institute for Child and Health, and she was concerned because. Um, there was no focus on women. It was just on babies and pregnant women. And so she was putting together a volunteer board of women researchers and, and physicians to focus on, on women's health issues. And they were all, as I said, doctors and physicians, you know, brilliant and, and everything, but um, she wanted this to be, you know, an, organi a, a, an organization that could make changes happen. And uh, the psychiatrist that I was friendly with introduced me to her. And I was, uh, not only did I work at the APA, but I ran their political action committee. So I, I knew a lot of the members of Congress, especially the women, because I made a point of of giving money to women, which which was not normally done at that point, which was turned out to be very lucky, needless to say. Um, so, and also my husband was in media, he was a journalist. And so I knew, you know, everybody in the media, television and uh, newspapers. And so she decided, you know, that I would be an asset um, in, in terms of doing being in Washington as opposed to obviously just you know doing research which is important but they wanted someone that knew Washington and could potentially get things done if you know whatever we knew we were going to do which at that point we had no idea so one thing led to another um we went to the uh, Florence went to a, a small PR company and said that uh, she wanted to focus on an an ICHD to to uh, incorporate research on women's health issues. Why focus just on an ICHD? Why don't we look at all the institutes? So we figured, okay, why not? 
um, we made an appointment on the Hill with the Congressional Women's Caucus. At the time, it had been a staple on Capitol Hill and it had been bipartisan. And Pat Schroeder and Olympia Snow had been the um, the, the co-leaders of it um, for years. Anyway, we went to the um, we went to the office and we started talking about you know, our idea and the fact that women's health was not being focused on at the NIH. And um, one of them went back, I don't know, into the files, wherever they were, and came out and said that there had been a report um, a, a few years prior, um, uh, basically noting that women's health was that the that women's health was not being focused on and women were not in clinical trials. It turns out that um, you can't basically tell the NIH or the FDA, you know, that they need to do something. And I, I guess you need to have, you know, hearings and all this other stuff before you can get to that point. But if they've been told to do something, you can investigate to see whether they've done it or not. So then we went to Congress and we went to Henry Waxman and, um, and and a couple of other members, and I think Olympia Snow, and they wrote, they asked the, the government accounting office, the GAO, to um, investigate the, the NIH. And of course, the answer was there wasn't doing anything. And then we did the same thing for the F today. So that's how the whole thing got started. And how it turned into, went from a volunteer organization and how I became the head of it is... I got very involved in uh, the Clinton campaign and I got friendly with Hillary and I had done an event for her. And at the event, um, she was, this was when Bill was, was running in the primaries and she was talking about um, going around the country, talking to women about different issues. And so I went over to her at the end of her presentation and I, told her that if she was going to be going around the country talking about women, um, she might want to talk about women's health. And so the next day when I got into the office, the APA, I, I, I was told that Hillary called. The next board meeting, I, I, I said to the board, you know, now that the, the Clintons are making women's health an issue and, and someone's really talking about it, and nobody else was at that time. It's not like now where there's so many different women's health groups. Um, I think we should go from being a volunteer organization to a real organization. So, uh, and they, were, they interviewed people for about six months. They were looking, I think, primarily at doctors and researchers. And I, I, I remember writing some long something dissertation or whatever, basically saying how they needed they needed someone who knew Washington. As I said earlier, I knew the media. I knew the members of Congress, and so they finally realized that that was probably a good idea. So I became the head of the society. So I went home that night, and I said to my husband, I've got good news and bad news. And he said, and he said what's that? I said, the good news is I'm going to be the CEO of the Society for Women's Health. It was the Society for the Advancement of Women's Health Research initially. I said, the bad news is we have no money. We had no money. We didn't have staff. We had we didn't have an office. We had nothing. It was just me. Um, so that's another story. <laughs> but I think, and I try to remember how this happened. I think, you know, because I ran the political action committee, I went to a lot of events. Of course, they were, you know, the events would be health related for obvious reasons. They would have, you know. So I got friendly with a lot of the representatives of the pharma companies. And a lot of the advocates, a lot of the uh, alliance people and, rep and representatives from the pharmaceutical companies in D.C. were women. And when I started talking to them about the fact that no one was paying attention to women's health, women were in clinical trials, all of a sudden, you know, I was getting funding. I just sort of fell into it in a way. Um, and then, I mean, I obviously I could go on and on, but you guys have to read the book to get all the all the details. You mentioned this, that, you know, it really was that at that time, the society was, you know, the only voice sort of talking about this topic. And I do think we've seen that shift, right? I mean, now everybody wants to, 
talk about it, which is wonderful. Are there other ways in which you've seen sort of the state of women's health research and women's health generally change since then, in addition to sort of this, now there seems to be like more people who want to engage in this topic? Well, I think one of the, um, you know, one of the primary purposes uh, in the past and in the present, as as you know, is looking at sex differences. A, a lot of, I mean, there became, you know, there was a time when nobody said the word breast. I remember I was at the first congressional briefing where someone actually mentioned the word breast as in breast cancer. And of course, nobody talked, said the word menopause either. Um one of the things that did happen, and it took years, is that a lot of disease groups formed their own organizations. Um, and so they were able to, I, I don't know whether they were actually lobbying the Hill for getting funding or, or in terms of sex differences, I doubt it, but there were more sort of support groups and information for, for sufferers of those conditions and also pre for prevention. Um, the society was really the only one, I, I mean, as I said then, um, and still, I think, to a great extent, and hopefully continues to look at the sex differences. Um, the, the attention, obviously, was good on all these women's health issues. Um, I don't know that a whole lot changed at the NIH, and actually, did, things didn't really change at the FDA until Marsha Henderson got there. There wasn't there weren't any other groups that were really pushing the sex differences. It was a focus on various conditions of women's health, whether it be endometriosis or breast cancer, and even menopause. I mean, now all of a sudden there's ads on television about menopause. People are talking about menopause. Um, nobody was talking about menopause then. I mean, it was like, you know, so things things have definitely changed. But as you know, um, there's still a lot more to go. I mean, it's just the beginning, frankly. It's exciting to see the level of engagement for folks. Um, and it is very fashionable to be talking about some of these topics now. Right. Um, and to your point about sex differences, I'd love for you to talk about your book, which is called Sex Cells, C-E-L-L-S, The Fight right. to Overcome Bias and Discrimination in Women's Healthcare. So tell us, tell us about the book and what you hope to accomplish with it and what you hope readers get out of it. Okay. Well, first of all, you, you just heard, you know, a good, you know, portion of the book of how, although there's more details in between, but that's the general, um, I felt um, I, I just felt, and well, obviously, once you read the book, you'll see what it took to, you know, to, to get the FDA, to get the NIH, to get the Hill, um, to, to, to finally recognize um, the sex differences and, and, to, and to try to make advances. Although I must say, um, I, you know, there's still a lot of a, 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 a lot of things that haven't been done and haven't been concentrated on. Um, so the book really tells how we got. Um, I mean, one of the one of the more interesting things wasn't even sex differences. Then we were just talking about getting women in clinical trials. That was the issue, getting women in clinical trials. I go to the IOM, which has now changed its name, I think, to the Academy, but it was the Institute of Medicine. And asked them, and this is something that I, I wasn't aware of. Um, they held uh, would organize commissions that would meet over a series of years to, you know, investigate or uh, you know publish papers on, on certain areas of health. And so I went. I asked them about you know the possibility of the IOM ha having putting together a commission to look at the issue of, of women in clinical trials. And on, he, he told me that since it was a government agency, they only could take directives from, um, from the government, that uh, they couldn't take a directive from a nonprofit organization. It would have to be from a government entity. So then, I don't know if you want all the details, um, <laughs> the bottom line, um, is that I was able to raise a certain amount of money. He went 
to some of the basic science organizations, the academies, and then there was a whole bunch of them that I wasn't even aware of. The only way that they would contribute money is, is if they we it's the, it, the commission started looking at basic science that cells and animals because they were basic science organizations. And that's how that started, because the society really was focused on the inclusion of clinical trials. We weren't focusing on, uh, on, I mean, it was sex differences, but we weren't focusing on the basic biology of, of, of women. And then I had to get a government sponsor. So I went to Wanda Jones, who was head of women's health at, um, at HHS, and she sponsored it. And um, and that, and so, and then I I think the commission took something like six years. <laughs> it takes a long time. Yeah, it takes a long time, right? <laughs> yeah, and they came out with the biological contributions to human health. Does sex matter? And that was the name. That was the name of the um, of the commission's report. And all that's in the book. I think I've asked you this before, but I, I'm always curious to know, and I ask a lot of people this question, but if you had a magic wand, um, what is one thing, like, what is one thing that you would fix or do when it comes to women's health and women's health research? Well, I think one of the things that's really vital, and actually I had a recent conversation with uh, one of the researchers that I had worked with, it doesn't seem to be... Um, uh, a part of, of, of uh, medical school's curriculum. And if the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare professionals aren't learning this, then it's not going to happen. And apparently there are, and I actually, and, and, and you might want to do this too, I want to do a little bit more investigation into that because I had given a pre presentation years ago, actually at Mayo, about the fact that it had to be in the curriculum. And at the time, of course, you know, you're lucky if you had, you know, a woman in an office someplace in charge of, you know, women's health, whatever that was. Um, but from the from the conversation I had the other day, it seems that it's not a requirement. And if, if the people who are practicing medicine and the researchers, and the thing with the researchers, and this is another issue I spoke to her about, um, and we we tried to do some work on this when, when I was at the society, is to get the peer-reviewed journals to require um, that when there's research done, um, unless there's a, a good reason not to, I mean, if it's on prostate cancer or something, uh, that they need to require or, or have, and, and this of course was just, was a loophole a justification years ago, but hopefully wouldn't be anymore. If they're going to do a, a trial on a condition that affects both men and women or me a medication, clearly that affects both men and women, then they need to, and also, of course, what we haven't, we haven't discussed, but, you know, the book also focuses on ethnic differences. So there's that too, you know, black women get medicine out of cancer more than white women. And I know that uh, uh, Hispanic women also have different conditions because I've spoken, you know, we, I, I worked with the Hispanic Association and, and also the black groups, black women's groups. So they need um, they need to be in clinical trials. The research has to show whether they have whether they've been clinically relevant so that you can't just have, let's say, 30 percent women, 70 percent men. And then say, yes, the, you know, the, the drug was um uh, was, was successful and you know 45 percent of the uh, uh, of the participants well which 45 percent and was it men women what the difference I mean this makes it makes it makes life more complicated obviously for the researchers um but it is what it is and so many medications um it's really kind of amazing I think that so many medications that are out there, there have only been a few that have been taken off the market that have had uh, detrimental um, effects on women. You, you, so, you know, it's it, so it may not be that every medication has to be, you know, tailored 
differently for men and women, but you need to know when that is the case. When you look, you'll find, you know, if you don't look. That's right. That's right. exactly right. Yeah, right. no, I think you're right. The The medical school curriculum piece comes up often. Um, yeah. I think that people are genuinely surprised to learn that maybe your clinician did not learn anything about women's health. Right. Definitely <laughs> much about sex differences. And so I think that's really critical. And then this other issue too often comes up, right? As we think about what does the sex as a biological variable policy look like in future iterations, both for accountability, but also how do we integrate that across research? I think that there is a key factor there on the publication side, to your point. Like how do how are we making sure that that policy and just general investigation into sex differences is actually happening. So I think both of those would go a long way. There's a lot of conversation. We've alluded to this just about um, women's health research generally. And, you know, you sort of started in, in talking about the Clinton administration, and now we're seeing another first lady um, talk about women's health research, which is exciting. Although I think we probably both know that the real work starts actually now to actually get things done. But I wonder what, what excites you the most about the future of women's health research? Where do you see this field in five, 10, or even 20 years from now? I won't be around in, in, in 10 or 20 years. So, but I, the whole thing about AI and, um, it's kind of scary in a way. I mean, on, on one level, it has the uh, potential of doing, you know, great things on another level. Um, it also has the potential of having a lot of, you know, erroneous information. The other thing is, um, is personalized medicine, of course, is, is another area that um, is growing that really didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so I do think, you know, between personalized medicine and all this new technology, um, you know, but sort of remains to be seen. I, I hope we don't have to wait that long. I would like to see every medicine on, that's, that's being proved to go on the market now. Um, and the other thing is, Obviously, the sex differences is, is very, is, uh, is you know, what, what I spent my, you know, my career on. But there's still so much we don't know about fibroids and endometriosis, conditions that, you know, not only disproportionately, but only affect women to a great extent. And, you know, we're still waiting for um, people get misdiagnosed. Endometriosis is, you know, is isn't diagnosed correct. And the other thing is even cardiovascular issues. I mean, it was all um, focused on men. And now we know that we're not, obviously both have heart attacks, but there are different kinds of heart attacks. And there are some that are more prevalent in women and, the di and, they, and they, they, they go undiagnosed. So um, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. And, um, you know, uh, the, the world is gonna be very different in 10, 20 years, you know? And so, you know, is per personalized medicine going to be part of AI? Is there going to be something that, you know, somebody invents that supersedes AI? You know, I don't know. But I guess right now we have to focus on what we've got and what we have and to educate um, the people that are being, that are, are going into any, any area of, of health um, health policy or um, health care. And of course, women, you know, need to, to know that when they go into a, a doctor's office, uh, they need to be taken seriously and they, and they have to be sort of advocates for themselves. And if the doctor says, don't worry about it, or, you know, you're, you're just anxious. If you're having terrible cramps, you know, if he doesn't listen to you or she doesn't listen to you, find another doctor.